Hello. Highway this week comes from Ipswich, the county town of Suffolk. We start the programme in this shopping centre, the town's newest acquisition. There's a very good reason for that, which I'll tell you about later. But first, watch this. Ramparts, a brand new shopping centre which was built, strangely enough, by the church commissioners. The church, you see, is amongst us in ways we would hardly expect. The very name Tower Ramparts suggests something much older than late 20th century property development, and quite rightly so, because Ipswich is a very ancient town. This is the head of the River Orwell, the nucleus around which the town has grown. Ipswich is here because it forms a vital link in the trading route between Northern Europe and the English Midlands. It has been so from the Stone Age to the time when the docks were built to connect with the road and railway systems. So, in a way, the people of Ipswich have been a barometer of Britain's success. Wealth in Ipswich comes when Britain is trading well, and that's why much of the best architecture in the town derives from times when the British economy was flourishing. Of course, every town needs its civic buildings from which it can speak to the people. There's the Town Hall, built in 1868, and from the same period, the beautiful chequered flintwork of the Civic Church. It was the thought of speaking to the people which became the basis for tonight's programme. We've seen the shopping centre that belonged to the church. Now we come to the church itself, the Civic Church of St Mary Le Tower, a church which speaks to the people in many voices. Two of those voices are particularly famous. Listen to this.
was the first voice of the church. The choir of St. Mary Le Tower singing the Gloria from the evening service in F by Charles Wood. We'll hear both of them later. Now for the second voice, which has been called the loudest voice of the church, because it reaches out from the church tower to the people. Listen again. of the bells spreads around the gentle slopes which form the head of the river and which seem to gather in the town of Ipswich. It's a call for everyone to hear. The voice of the church which speaks at once to the whole town and to every individual person within it. Nobody knows better than the church that a community consists of thousands of individual people, each one of whom is different from all those around him. And yet there's one thing in which all people are the same. People, as the song says, need people. And here to sing it from a vantage point over a shopping precinct in the heart of the town is James Smiley. There's more to that song than a warm-hearted sentiment. Take the people, for instance, who visit the Tower Rampart shopping centre. It's bright, it's new, it's fun. It's a commercial palace, and as we said before, it belongs to the church, so it must be a good thing. And so it is. Most of us will come in here and take advantage of everything it has to offer without giving it a second thought. But there are people, you know, for whom all this is an unattainable prize, glittering though it may be. We've got to remember that for every person who's upwardly mobile, there's always certainly somebody who's going down. The truth is that we need them as much as they need us. I found out more about this when I visited a branch of the YMCA, tucked away in a residential street. Had it not been for the notice board, it would have been easy to miss. But it was in here, 
that I learned how the best of us can help those who are not quite as lucky. With me is Ashley Seaborn, the manager of a very interesting scheme which the YMCA is running here in Ipswich. Ashley, the YMCA isn't an institution you normally associate with education, and yet it's part of your scheme, isn't it? Yes, the, the public image is one of the YMCA involved in leisure pursuits and accommodation. In fact, the vocational educational aspect is, is very much a historic one. It grew out of the 19th century, the Christian's concern for the welfare of people exploited by the masters of the Industrial Revolution. And George Williams was the founder of the YMCA. He uh, worked with Draper's apprentices back in 1840. And from there, it's grown into an organisation which very much cares for the spirit, uh, the soul and body of man and the environment in which those needs are met. Because caring is very much part of the project you're into now, isn't it? Yes, we have a large uh, workshop which uh, takes in caring uh, skills, youngsters that are interested in working with elderly people, uh, handicapped um, or toddlers. But in a lot of cases, youngsters have a desperate need still for training with numeracy, literacy, planning, problem solving and communication. So you start off from the very beginning then? The yes, yeah. yes. And each course is arranged for each youngster according to their own needs. Some will be ready to go out on work experience with employers locally at an early stage. Some would need to gain confidence in the workshop before they could do that. We see that very much as our job to encourage them to try things out and we have a range of employers and we call them sympathetic employers because they will take youngsters that they need to help with their communication as well as the work we've been doing in the workshops. It's a very worthwhile scheme, isn't it? Well, you'd need to see some of the youngsters and what they're like when they start, how desperate they are to find out what they really can contribute as adults. Because they come to you voluntarily, that's the important that's thing, That's right, isn't it? yes. There is no compulsory element to what we do at all. They're free to leave at any time. Well, let's go and have a look at some of them, shall we? Yes, well, the practical work's in the workshop, so that's where we ought to go, isn't it? And so Ashley Seaborn took me on a conducted tour of the Training for Life scheme. The first place we visited was a workshop devoted to engineering, woodworking and the building trades. Most of the young men working in here have left school with no qualifications at all. Yet, by coming here, they give themselves the opportunity to learn a useful trade and to get some work experience with companies in Ipswich. That's yeah. <laughs> What I found so encouraging was that people who have been through this apprenticeship have a better chance of finding a job than ordinary school leavers. The next workshop was for drama students. What did you do over the weekend, then? I went to the pub for a quick drink. Yeah, I went up with John Ball. I had a disco on there, but it weren't any good. Wasn't it? Nah. What'd you do Sunday? Well, I stayed in to watch East End, so I couldn't miss that. Right, that's good. W what happens now, then? Well, this is where she comes on. She comes along here, and she helps her get some stuff off the shelf. Lovely. Sorry to interrupt, Mark. I've got a part for a nice little fat fella. We might have, yeah. <laughs> what do the students expect to get out of this? Well, quite a lot of things, really. Training for life is a, is a kind of stepping stone coming out of school and it's a stepping stone on the way to work, the world of work. And what we try and do here is if, give young people confidence to deal with everyday situations. We do this in the drama workshop by doing role play situations, um, improvising scenes, reading, etc. But, um, and really, the workshop itself is, is kind of run by the young people who are up here at the time. So it's very much about group work. But here, we have three other workshops, and they are retail, community care, and craft and design. It was in the craft workshop that I found I could relate very closely to what was going on. The people working in here were in communion with one another. Each was building up not just his own, but everybody else's self-confidence. There was a warmth and understanding between Cathy the tutor and her students, which was, if you like, an act of faith in humanity. of rain that falls, a flower grows. I believe 
that somewhere in the darkest night a candle glows. I believe for everyone who goes astray, someone will come to show the way. I believe, I believe, I believe above the storm the smallest prayer will still be heard. I believe that someone in the great somewhere hears every word. Every time I hear a newborn baby cry, or touch a leaf, or see the sky, then I know why. Training for life is part of the youth training scheme. I met someone else for whom YTS had been a good start. Key marks. Set. I found him on the Northgate athletic track. His name is Austin Solomon. Oh, you've got good breaks, Austin. <laughs> nice to see you. Oh, thanks. Hi. <laughs> Now, two wonderful things have happened to you in your short life. I mean, you were the junior 200-meter uh, uh, champion, weren't you? Yeah, for well, two years running. Then last year, I came the second in the county and second in the eastern counties as well. And anyway, that's the second thing that happened here to you. What was that? Oh, yeah. I met this girl called Gabrielle. She came up here. Well, she joined our group while we were training. And I thought, yeah, she's a bit all right sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I started talking to her. And I found that I could talk to her about God and everything and she could talk to me about it and I know we just found out we could just talk to each other you, you get some people you can talk to and they sort of turn off or whatever but with her I could really talk to her about it don't feel yourself conscious that's right yeah, yeah. and um, I ended up going to well she asked me to go to church and I thought yeah right but deep down in mind I thought yeah I'll go to see her yeah. but I thought no I better not because I want to go because I want to go for myself and because I want to know God so we were in town together one Saturday and we met this boy and he invited us to go to church and uh, I made a promise that, that day that I'll go to church that Sunday night. No matter what church it was, I'll go to church. And uh, I met her and she came and uh, said, well, she's going to her church at St. Matthew's. That's incredible. The, the people in there, it's like, <laughs> like saying the Holy Spirit just came upon them, you know, and they're really just rejoicing. And I found out that's where I want to be. You know, people say it's a boring place, church and all that. It's for old people. But it's not right, you know. I went there and I found what I want. Me, I was the person who wanted glory. I wanted to walk the street and go, hi. And what people say to me, ah, oh, look, there's Austin. That's me. Yeah. But I didn't want, now I don't want it no more. I found what I want. I found God. I found my love. I found my glory. And I found all my riches as well. And that's what I want for myself. And no one can take that away from me. And so it was that Austin Solomon introduced us to the pure joy of a BOP service in St. Matthew's Church. BOP, B-O-P, where everybody who comes literally brings other people.
The quiet calm of the diocesan offices seem a far cry from the enthusiasm of the BOP scheme. And yet, curiously enough, it's the diocesan secretary, David Hennessy, who is the leading light behind that and other schemes which aim at getting the voice of the church to reach out into the community. David, what is the BOP scheme? You mean the BOP scheme? Uh, <laughs> the BOP. It's, a, <laughs> it's a, a service for young people held in Ipswich uh, at St Matthew's Church. It started about four years ago um, as a result of uh, a lot of feelings amongst people that uh, we ought to do something for the young people of the town. Following the David Watson mission in the town, then following on Mission England, there's a tremendous sense that we were letting the young people down. We really needed to spend a lot more time concentrating on young people. So at St. Matthew's, about uh, uh, two years ago, we started uh, by allowing young people to take over the church one Sunday evening per month. And the rector said, well, you can do what you like. And I, I still think he regrets it. But if, 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 what happened was we started off with about 20 young people meeting together and just enjoying free worship. And then the thing has grown in two years to, so that now we have about four to 500 young people every time we have a service there. And it's tremendously encouraging because the young people are asked to go out and bring their friends in. So if you like, Bob means bring other people. And they're all encouraged to do that. How do you see the future of the church here in Ipswich? Well, I think it's very bright. I think it's very encouraging to see so many young people actually attached to the churches. Uh, not only are all the churches uh, in the centre of Ipswich, for instance, doing reasonably well, but the young people are bringing a whole different dimension into the, into the, the churches. They're, they're enthused and uh, encouraged by what's going on at the bigger services. And then they go back and change their own services. I think sometimes the leaders of these churches feel slightly uh, uh, aggrieved with us. But nevertheless, they go back and they're enthused. And then they go out and tell their friends and bring them in as well. I, I often think it's one of the hardest places in the world to find a non-Christian in it, which, <laughs> which, which is very encouraging indeed. But the, the churches are doing their stuff and they're realizing that they've not got to have the ghetto mentality. They've got to get out and, and, and bring the gospel to people and the young people are in the front of this. Thanks very much for talking to us, David. Thank you. Mm. Everything that David has just said, and indeed everything we've seen on the program, seems to be encouraging. It seems that the voice of the church is again being welcomed by the people. Here's a simple reading that summarizes it. It's read for us by Georgie Glenn. One Sunday morning, drowsing in the back pew of a little country church, I dimly heard the old preacher urge his flock to stop worrying about your own halo and shine up your neighbors. And it left me sitting up wide awake because it struck me as just about the best 11 word formula for getting along with people that I ever heard. I like it for its implication that everyone in some area of life has a halo that's worth watching for and acknowledging. I like it for the picture it conjures up, everybody industriously polishing away at everybody else's little circle of divine light. I like it for the firm way it shifts the emphasis from self to interest and concern for others. Finally, I like it because it reflects a deep truth People have a tendency to become what you expect them to be. People have a tendency to become what you expect them to be. How very true. Which brings us back to the first point we made in this program. That the church finds its way into our lives in ways we would hardly expect, like the shopping centre. It speaks, in other words, with many voices. And all we have to do, as the people of Ipswich seem to have done, is to open our ears to listen. So, if there's anything to be learned from Ipswich, it is that the church is always there, speaking to us in whatever kind of voice we expect of it. It's wonderful to consider that, as we said before, there are so many people, and each one is different from all the rest, and yet there's still somebody who can speak to each one individually. That's the one thing which, despite our differences, unites us all. So it seemed fitting to join with the Olive Quantrill singers and the choir of St. Mary Latour to sing Onward Christian Soldiers.
wonder what a Christian soldier says to him. And religion certainly is on the march here in Ipswich. Happily, as David Hennessy said, it's attracting more and more young people. Next week, Highway goes to Rochester. I'll see you then. <laughs>